much. I'm Catherine Santoro, Director of Programming at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. And on behalf of NICM, welcome to our webinar today. One out of five Americans feel lonely or socially isolated, and loneliness can be life-threatening. It raises the risk of premature death as much as smoking or obesity, making it an emerging public health threat. Social isolation also accounts for $6.7 billion in annual federal spending among older adults. To explore strategies to address loneliness and social isolation, we're pleased to have a prestigious panel of experts with us today. Before we hear from them, I want to quickly thank Nickham's president and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, and the Nickham team who helped to convene this event today, including Kate Ellis, Carolyn Myers, and Kirsten Wade. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers, along with today's agenda and copies of slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag Loneliness Epidemic. I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Donald Berwick, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Don is also a former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and has worked extensively with the British National Health Service, so he brings a truly international perspective on emerging models of care to meet the social needs of Americans. We're so honored to have him with us today. Don? Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Thank you all for uh, the chance to spend some time with you on a topic that feels really, really important to me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with my uh, colleagues on the panel, and I look forward to a really uh, exciting meeting. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing to Julianne and Robin get into specifics, but I'm going to be talking more generally about the background. I see the issue of loneliness as a component of, a, of the larger domain of social determinants of health, and I want to explain that to you as, uh, as best I can. Uh, to do so, I'm going to use the words of a colleague of mine from England, uh, Ben Collins, is a young researcher at the King's Fund in England. He's recently published a phenomenal report on Montefiore Medical Center in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, I mean. I'm not going to talk about Montefiore specifically, but the words of his report are so eloquent, I wanted to begin, uh, by, uh, begin by quoting him. Um, uh, here, here's, here's what Ben says. Every day in New York, the D train running from Coney Island to the Bronx achieves an astonishing process of social segregation. Picking up the train in Midtown Manhattan, uh, you join a representative <coughs> uh, mix of the New York population, suited professionals, manual workers, children going to school. As the train crosses 85th Street uh, in uh, alongside Central Park, the residents of uh, the of the upper um, the, the residents of the Upper East Side of Manhattan, um, uh, you have about an average household income of $180,000. Uh, smoking, obesity, and chronic diseases are well below the national average. <clears throat> Life expectancy stands at 85, even better than Japan. By the time you cross 165th Street, the heart of the Bronx, uh, almost all the white people and all the suited professionals have exited the train. Average household income has shriveled from $180,000 to $45,000. To $45, Unemployment has doubled. <clears throat> in the South Bronx, 65% of children are born into poverty. Between 85th Street and 165th Street, life expectancy drops by a decade. Uh, six months for every minute on the subway, 2.3 years for every mile traveled. The residents of projects in Fordham Heights can glimpse Trump Tower in the distance, but like the view from... Um, Oldham to Manchester in, in London, uh, or Tower Hamlets to the city of London, the wealth there may well be on another planet. Few healthcare organizations have been matched to such an equity. The social and environmental forces propelling poor people into sickness are too great. The tools of traditional healthcare, the pills and the operation, inadequate to the challenge. Uh, ben is here eloquently describing uh, the effect of what is, we call in, in, the, in the jargon social determinants of illness. It's not just an American issue, nor is it just an issue of poverty. There are all sorts of circumstances that contribute to illness that are, um, that are uh, uh, dramatic, have dramatic impact on our well-being. This is the so-called subway map for London. Uh, if you travel from uh, Oxford Circus to, um, to East London, uh, the, the life expectancy differs by 75 years. 
and not all of the parameters that we just talked about in the Bronx Manhattan comparison apply. What is this difference about? I mean, we are looking here differences in health status and well being that absolutely overwhelm any differences that we achieve through interventions in healthcare. The effect of statins on survival or even any form of surgery that I know, cancer chemotherapy, uh, the, the, anything we do in medicine has no impact that, that even begins to approximate for populations these differences like 10, 10 or 20 years of life expectancy. What's going on? Well, the answer begins favorably, which is we know what's going on. The science of the generators of health is extremely well developed. I've shown you here three of the, of the giants in the field, the work of Sir Douglas uh, Black and his colleagues in the, in the Black Commission in England, which, which published the report on the health divide, which absolutely lays out the sources of these variations in health status. Uh, Julian Tudor Hart, a, a, an amazing Welsh GP who died just, uh, just this year, um, published repeatedly on the effects of community and community characteristics uh, on uh, health and well-being in the communities he came to know very well. His last book called The Political Economy of Healthcare is well worth your reading. It, dealt, it deals with the relationships between policy and well-being. And then probably the outstanding thinker of our age, uh, uh, Sir Michael Marmot, also in, but you know, probably the most respected student in the world today of the health gap, the understanding of generators of, of, of wellness and well-being and why people can differ so much in, in their health status um, independent of the care they get. And the one consistent finding from all of these, all of these studies, all of the reports, is the effect of clinical care, the $3 trillion that we spend in American health care, uh, on well-being is, is it's pushing on a strain. Clinical care, to overstate it, has very, very little to do with health status. Uh, once you're sick, it makes a difference in, in whether you'll get well. But why you get sick, that's not determined at all by clinical care, not even access to clinical care. Uh, this pie chart comes from the World Health Organization showing the effects of physical environment, genes and biology. Maybe we can't change genes, but the rest we can. And the social and economic factors, in addition to the health, health behavior factors, are 70% of the variability in healthcare, seven times as important as anything we could do with a direct, direct uh, delivery of clinical services. My colleagues in, in, uh, in Sweden, in Jönköping, Sweden, uh, long ago gave me this uh, next diagram, which is an attempt to show uh, the, uh, the array of factors that appear to determine our health. And this, this particular graph in many, many forms can be found throughout the world's literature now on health determinants and has been fully embraced by the World Health Organization in its work on health in all policies. Uh, you'll notice that healthcare does appear in the, as a factor, but it's a tiny, tiny factor. And so if we were visiting from Mars and came to Earth and said, gee, it's so nice you, you people are, are uh, so invested in trying to achieve well-being for your populations. Show me how you do it. The visitor from Mars would become very confused very quickly. They would see that in the United States we are spending $3 trillion on this tiny little circle of determinants of health as if it were somehow magically we're going to bring us health and well-being. And the amount we're spending on the rest is infinitesimal. It's tiny compared to what we're spending on this uh, repair shop uh, called healthcare. Um, the, um, the term for this overall picture that's widely used is, is social determinants of health. I guess by that we mean non-healthcare delivery determinants of health. Um, in any uh, analysis of the array of social determinants, what we're talking about, which are include a very wide array of things, including the physical environment and, and nutrition and, edu and uh, exercise. Um, almost every single model of social determinants ends up with something like this, and this comes from the World Health, Health Organization. And what I, what I want you to look at is the yellow circle kind of intermediating between all of the other generators of health and well-being and what they call here social and community networks. This is a matter of connectedness. Connectedness, the ability to be part of a community, to have a community um, that helps you get through your life, so to speak, and uh, social systems that help you, is absolutely core to any modern theory of the achievement of well-being. It's not, a, it's not a, just a mechanical process. It's a, it's a 
It's a socio sociologic process, a relationship process. I'll give you examples from two scholars in the field. One that I admire a great deal is an American um, physician named Wayne Jonas, who has been the, the CEO of the Samueli Institute. He, Wayne has followed a trail that he calls salutogenesis, the generation of well-being. And, and what, what he points out is the generation of well-being, called it salutogenesis, is not the same as the, as, the, as, the fix, as the fixing of disease. It has to do with the establishment of optimal healing environments that can close that 10 or 20 year gap on that subway ride. And you see in this very simplified version of Wayne's work, uh, the, the four characteristics, psychological resilience, this has to do with the mental state that a person enters, enters the world with and, and conducts themselves through the world. Physical exercise and sleep, you already knew that. Optimum nutrition and substance abuse, of course. And then look at that social integration piece. Wayne feels, and he has the data to show, that one's ability to integrate into society, uh, to use the terms of this webinar, not to be lonely, closely relate to achieving well-being overall. Uh, another uh, uh, recently better known um, example is the work of uh, Dan Buettner, who's written uh, a lot about blue zones. Blue zones are a dozen or so areas around the world where Dan has gone, where people live commonly more than 100 years. And he's asked the question, what characterizes these societies where people live long? And, and he's, got, he, he, he's got these nine, he calls it the blue zone nine, the nine factors that he seems to find everywhere he looks, physical activity, uh, purpose in life, uh, uh, the ability to relax, uh, eating wisely, making good choices about the, what you eat. But look at that bottom three. He calls it belonging, a healthy social network, connection with some form of spirituality, and the connection to family. This is, this is the opposite of loneliness, and Buettner shows that if you want to live long and well, don't be lonely, don't be isolated, find ways to connect. So, so that's my introductory summary of what I'll call the science. The science shows that, that the clinical effects here are not marginal. This is an article from the British Medical Journal Family Journal called Heart, which is their cardiology journal, and um, the title, Loneliness and Social Isolation as isolation is Risk Factors for Coronary Heart Disease and Stroke. Look at the effect. Coronary heart disease, a 29% difference in coronary heart disease rates between, um, in incident rates between people who score high on loneliness or in isolation or low, and a 32% difference in stroke. We know no drug, no medicine, no intervention, no surgery that changes well-being uh, at the level of 29% risk of coronary heart disease or 32% risk of stroke. It cannot be done with health care. It has to be done with community. And so I'll, I'll summarize the science as I read it. As a force in shaping our health and well-being, medical care pales in, in comparison with the circumstances and properties of the communities in which we live. Few aspects of community are more powerful in this regard than is the degree of connectedness and social support for individuals. So we're in this together, and when we stay together, we achieve better health. And if we don't, now you're going to hear from two real experts in the field, Julianne and Robin, one an academician and one a practitioner who will tell us more about actually how to capitalize on this immense amount of science. So back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for sharing uh, that perspective on how communities can really come together and help meet the, the social needs and really improve health and well-being. Our next speaker is Dr. Julianne holt lundstad Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Brigham Young University. Her research has been seminal in the recognition of loneliness and social isolation as risk factors for early mortality, and we're so fortunate to have her with us today to share her work. Thank you so much, um, and that was a, a fantastic presentation um, uh, to follow. Uh, I am going to uh, put a bit of a, a, a spotlight on the problem, and so what I hope to really cover is first defining what we mean by some of the terms that we use, because Oftentimes terms are, are used very loosely, so we, I think it's important to define these. Uh, also, uh, what are the estimates of, of the size of the problem, the seriousness of the problem, as well as some risk factors and, and potential solutions. So um, one of the things I think it's important to first distinguish is that loneliness and social isolation 
are often used interchangeably, but they don't mean the same thing. Uh, so social isolation is thought to be much more objective. Um, it's actually uh, being alone or having few relationships or few or infrequent social contact. Uh, whereas loneliness is thought to be more of a subjective experience of feeling alone or the discrepancy between one's uh, desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. And so it's important to recognize that someone can be isolated but not feel lonely. So they might actually um, uh, enjoy their solitude. Uh, and conversely, someone can feel lonely uh, but not isolated. So, for instance, um, uh, people often report feeling lonely even uh, in large groups or at parties or uh, other kinds of social settings. Uh, they may still feel lonely. So it's important to, to distinguish that these are, are different, but, of course, they, they can go together, uh, but not always. So... Uh, in terms of really defining what exactly is the issue or what is the problem, uh, it's, it's, there are often a lot of other terms used as well. And so it's really important to recognize, like, is it the actual perception of loneliness that's the issue? Is it lacking social contact or um, interaction? Maybe it's lacking a close intimate partner or someone in the home to rely upon in times of need. Um, maybe it's uh, uh, having strained relationships. Uh, but I, I, I hope you can see that even by this incomplete list that there are a variety of ways in which this might be an issue and that uh, – having a lack of clear definition may be a potential uh, barrier to really addressing uh, the problem. So uh, in looking to the research and the way in which it has been studied, we can see that it has been measured in also a variety of ways that can generally be categorized in under uh, three general headings. Uh, and so the first really gets at, uh, is referred to as structural aspects of, of social connections. Uh, so this gets at the existence of uh, social ties and roles um, and might include things like size of social network, social integration, marital status, living alone, in essence, the presence or absence of others in our lives. Uh, but, of course, we also know that um, uh, uh, functional aspects of relationships are important as well. So some research has looked at uh, the kinds of resources that are available or perceived to be available uh, via social relationships. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, others have also looked at the positive and negative qualities of relationships because we need to acknowledge that not all relationships are entirely positive. And so uh, some have looked at relationship satisfaction, conflict, and ambivalence. So as a, a means of trying to – oh, and I should mention uh, that each of – these measurement approaches uh, have been significantly associated with health outcomes. Uh, and yet uh, there are relatively low correlations between them, suggesting that they may be all having an influence on health, but perhaps through potentially different mechanisms. So uh, to try to address the issue around uh, definition and defining the problem, uh, my colleagues and I have proposed using the term social connection as an umbrella term that would encompass the structural, functional, and quality aspects of relationships that all influence physical health, and that we can consider this on a continuum such that uh, high social connection uh, or, or 
tight social connection would be associated with low risk or uh, protection, whereas low social connection would be associated with high risk. So, uh, it, it, in other words, um, we can think of terms such as social isolation and loneliness uh, as being indicators of low social connection, uh, but other kinds of indicators um, such as structural and, and uh, quality, such as living alone and poor quality relationships, would also be forms of low social connection. But we also need to acknowledge uh, that the high end uh, may be protective. So uh, we define the problem as low social connection or social disconnection. So in terms of uh, what is the prevalence rates around this or to what extent uh, is the population affected by this, uh, we first need to acknowledge that uh, many indicators are not routinely collected. And so we uh, getting precise estimates may be difficult. Uh, the one source of data that is uh, routinely collected is uh, U.S. Census data, which really gets more at some of these structural aspects. So, for instance, a quarter of the population, or more than a quarter of the population lives alone, over half of the U.S. Uh, population is unmarried. One in five have never married, and the divorce rate in the U.S. is around 40% of first marriages. Uh, of course, caution should be um, uh, used in assuming that uh, just because someone lives alone or is unmarried that uh, they may be socially uh, disconnected. Uh, because they may very well have uh, a very large social network. Um, so this is a imperfect and crude measure. Nonetheless, uh, both living alone and marital status are not only risk factors for loneliness, but they are independent risk factors for premature mortality. Uh, when we look to other kinds of indicators uh, of social disconnection, we can look to uh, uh, surveys, for instance, the recent Cigna report suggests that nearly half of Americans uh, report sometimes or always feeling alone. Now, it's important to recognize that um, there are uh, a, a variety of different surveys out. Uh, another estimate uh, found this closer to 22%. And uh, because of measurement differences, these uh, estimates may vary. But nonetheless, uh, even a, a more conservative estimate of 22% still suggests that a significant portion of the population is um, affected. We also, um, as acknowledged earlier, uh, need to recognize that there may be uh, economic costs associated with this. And so, uh, for instance, the AARP study that found $6.7 billion in additional Medicare spending each year. And, of course, this was just uh, focused on, the, on older adults and focused on Medicare spending and doesn't take into account other ages or other sources of costs that may be much larger. So um, in terms of uh, establishing uh, the evidence around the seriousness of the problem or the magnitude of the problem, uh, my colleagues and I have conducted a couple of meta-analyses, which uh, is a way of combining the available data worldwide uh, to determine the magnitude of the risk for uh, early mortality. And uh, in my first meta-analysis, we looked at, uh, we, this included data from 148 uh, studies and over 300,000 participants. And uh, what this data showed was that social connection was associated with a 50% uh, reduction in risk for uh, early mortality. And, and that was, of course, adjusting for age and initial health status 
uh, that could rule out uh, reverse causality. And so in, if, uh, and, and my second meta-analysis looked specifically at indicators of objective and subjective isolation. Uh, and so what we found, oops, let me go back to that. The un, Unfortunately, it doesn't look like the, the information is, uh, oh, maybe I can do that. There we go. Uh, we found that the in, that uh, this this meta analysis included data from over 3.4 million participants, and uh, what we found was that uh, the risk for loneliness, social isolation, and living alone each were each significantly predicted risk for premature mortality, uh, and and did so equivalently. So I think that's rather remarkable that both objective and subjective isolation are important and equivalently predict risk. And uh, this was consistent across uh, gender, initial health status, cause of death, and country of origin. So uh, to really benchmark this uh, against other kinds of risk factors that we take quite seriously for our health, uh, the orange bars on here represent uh, a variety of, of indicators of social connection. The blue bars indicate uh, a variety of, of leading health indicators, uh, the top being smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. Uh, and and uh, what we can see is that although there is um, variation in how strongly these different indica social indicators uh, predict risk, as do some of these other leading health indicators, uh, the the blue bars on the bottom that that all of them uh, are either equivalent to or have a stronger uh, effect include physical activity, obesity, and air pollution factors that can receive considerable attention and considerable resources. Uh, we also have good data that uh, this affects other indicators of health and well-being. Uh, as mentioned earlier, um, the risk for uh, heart disease and stroke. Uh, it's also associated with a 64% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Wounds heal slower, and uh, it, it's associated with greater perceived stress and depression, so other kinds of emotional and mental well-being, uh, as well as poor sleep that uh, in turn is also linked to uh, mental and physical health outcomes. Uh, there are a number of risk factors that have been identified and uh, I'll just highlight a few. So for instance, uh, poor health and well-being, including things such as mobility impairments, cognitive impairments, and poor mental health can increase your risk for being socially disconnected. Uh, life transitions, uh, role loss and change, including leaving the workforce, loss of partner, family, or friends, uh, societal barriers, uh, lack of access and inequality and communication barriers, um, all of these have been linked as potential uh, risk factors for uh, for social disconnection and, and uh, loneliness uh, in particular. So the, the top line includes some uh, demographic factors that and as well as uh, uh, social factors that can also put you at increased risk specifically for loneliness. So um, we need to recognize that uh, there um, are multiple causes. And because there's no single causal factor, uh, no one approach will work for everyone. So uh, for those that uh, uh, with the underlying uh, impetus or cause was uh, mobility issues versus someone who um, had a loss of a spouse, uh, 
the approach might be very different for one compared to the other. But we also need to recognize that m many other current public health issues also have multiple underlying causes, and therefore this uh, should not be a limiting factor in addressing this issue. So one of the key questions is what, what do we do about it, what works, what doesn't. And um, while there are, um, while there is evidence of the um, interventions that have been effective, um, there are also uh, some notable ex exceptions to this. And so we need to acknowledge uh, that the evidence is um, somewhat mixed around this. And so we do need to pay careful attention to our approaches in addressing this. Uh, one thing to note is that um, the of all of the different measurement approaches uh, in terms of predicting, uh, one of the least robust of these um, and is received support. And we need to acknowledge that just because someone receives support, it may not always be perceived as supportive and may not be helpful if it isn't uh, responsive to what is needed or desired. And so we do need to acknowledge the potential for this in, in, in our approaches that could limit our potential success. Uh, so to borrow from uh, public health, we need to also consider a social ecological model. The majority of interventions that uh, exist currently are very focused on the individual level. Uh, but according to this model, uh, we're missing many opportunities to intervene at interpersonal, organizational, community, and societal levels. And that we really also need to uh, consider uh, interventions that go beyond just tertiary level interventions that are aimed at those that are highest risk uh, or when the problem is severe, but rather also consider uh, primary and secondary level interventions where uh, we target this uh, at a preventative level early on um, uh, to, to prevent this. And then uh, finally, just uh, the way in which this can, can occur uh, typically goes through three general approaches. And so each, at, even at each of these levels, we uh, can consider whether the approaches are aimed at supporting and maintaining existing relationships, building new relationships, or are psychological approaches that are aimed to change thinking about relationships. And uh, with that, I, I will... Uh, uh, turn it over to Robin, who can uh, describe some of the efforts that uh, they are doing at Caremore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julianne, for sharing your important research and also just for your leadership on this issue and really drawing more attention to it. Um, we'll turn next to hear from Robin Caruso. She's the Chief Togetherness Officer at Caremore Health. Caremore is a subsidiary of Anthem, serving Medicaid and Medicare patients, and it's recognized as one of the most innovative models of care delivery for people with complex needs. And Robin uh, is here with us today to share really their first-of-a-kind effort to combat loneliness in the U.S. Robin? Thank you so much. And um I'm having problems seeing the slides, so I don't know. Um, I didn't see Julianne's at all, so I'm trying to make sure my slides are up, so if you might can assist me with that as I introduce our program a little bit. Um, so basically, um, I'm still not seeing them. Um, we can, we can so, advance. We can advance okay. for you. So we're on your first, you're on slide one right now. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm still not seeing that, so I'll just I'll go for my slides. So um, in 2007, in May, we launched our togetherness program at Caremore, 
And my background at Caremore is I came to Caremore 11 years ago because no matter what the doctor's medical interventions they were doing for our members, there would be a subset group that kept going into the hospital. And it was because of all the psychosocial issues that were going on. And so from from that point of view, um, that's where we began to deal with the social determinants of healthcare. And one of the earliest things that we would look at the patients we were seeing were the people that live alone and had very little social support. Um, and you can go to the, the next slide. Um, Julianne kind of talked about why we decided to not only um, create a program um, for loneliness and isolation because of all the health risks, that we wanted to tackle it and address it just like you would do a disease management program for diabetes. And so that's something CareMore is um, very uh, uh, proactive in, in managing chronic diseases. Actually, if you go to slide three, it talks about we did a survey with our, our members that we asked them, um, you know, what kind of things do they want to see um, their health care providers do? And um, not only did 27% of the seniors said, hey, we want our doctors to connect us to programs and activities in the community to stay helpful, but we want them to give us specific programs to really help manage um, our health issues. So we began the togetherness program. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and what we did there, we had three main goals. It was we really wanted to re-engage them in their health care. Um, some of them may be going into the emergency room for their health care. They were showing up, but they weren't really engaged in their health care. So um, and th um, that could really be described, I think, best in a story of working with one of our members who um, actually self-referred into our program talking about with his long chronic mental illness, how he, he just, he was so lonely, didn't have anything. But it was very clear as we started reaching out and calling him that he was very disengaged from his health and that he wasn't even keeping his appointments. And since we've been calling him and just having a friendly conversation, which was different from most type of um, health care um, outreaches, that some of the patients were a little taken back, were even asking to talk to my staff supervisors, thinking, you're not calling to ask me to come in for a health screening or my mammogram, but we were just calling to have a friendly connection. And so by having that friendly phone call, he began now caring a little bit more about himself, and he started showing up to his appointments. Um, and had not missed, and, and behavioral health said not only had he not missed any of his appointments, but he started saying, you know what, I want to try my medications now. And six weeks later, uh, my staff was so amazed to see that he was now um, carrying on normal conversations. And uh, I reviewed his chart not too long ago, and he's out riding his bicycle when we called him sometimes. Sometimes he's out, he had made a new friend, and then he was taking care of his um, his dental needs, something that he hadn't done in a long time. So really by just having that friendly phone call and calling and connecting to our members, that we want to get them reengaged in their health care. Um, the second piece is really connecting them to those community-based organizations for socialization, but also for all those other issues uh, that Don talked earlier about the social determinants of health care. My staff are called connectors, and it's not just about them having that great connection um, and having that great phone call, but it's also about connecting them to those community-based organizations. Um, two of the number one resources that we refer people to are transportation and Meals on Wheels. But we're also trying to get them engaged in something like um, if they're homebound, Senior Center about walls. If they're able to get out and we want to get them socializing, um, getting them engaged at a senior center. And we had one particular gentleman that um, sometimes after one phone call from my staff, they'll say, you know, um, I didn't realize until talking to you how long it's been since I went out. And uh, we had mailed him a calendar just for the local senior center. And he said, on Friday, they play music. I, I think that's something I can do. It's not too intimidating. And so he, um, that next Friday, he called, but he called, uh, we arranged for public transportation, and he called from the bus, and he was, like, really nervous to go. 
And but he said, I can hear your voice saying, I got this, I can do this. So it was more than just referring him. Julianne kind of alluded to that. You can offer them support and resources, but it's really kind of hand-holding them to get them connected to those resources. And then he let us know on Monday at his experience when he got there, it was kind of like high school, that all the ladies were dancing on the dance floor and the men were sitting around and just watching. And when he got there, he said it was so hard to get there that he, he just he found himself out on the dance floor, the only man out there dancing, and that he made quite a number of friends. And I got to meet him at one of our social events that we had and um, how much that just starting going to the senior center has impacted his life. But he was nominated to be the president of that organization. And that how just getting him connected to one community resource such as the senior center, how it's got him reengaged and given him more purpose and meaning. Um, and then the third uh, goal that we have is increasing their physical activity. Um, I think this was some of the things that um, was looked upon in, uh, by Don and by Julianne, but getting people out and exercising the impact that it can have on their health. Um, we have uh, gyms like Nifty After 50 or Silver Sneakers, and the gyms are very socially based as well. And so in this one particular case, um, and calling our members, it doesn't always happen overnight. I much sometimes use the analogy of our program in dating, that on that first, that first date, you can't tell the person you're going out with all the things that they're doing wrong and what they need to do. You really have to have that relationship. So this particular member, it had been four months into my staff calling her, and her barrier of leaving her home was she was in increased pain, and she used a walker, and she was a little embarrassed for people to see her out using a walker, and so she, that had kind of led to her uh, isolation. And so one of the things is that my staff had been talking to her and sending her calendars, and he finally said, I couldn't help but believe that if you were to get out and do some exercise, you might feel better. And even though she had already said to him, I've been there, I've done that, and it's all I can do to just get dressed and go to the doctor, she said, I know you really care about me, and if you think this would help me, I'm going to try it. And fast forward about six weeks later, she was actually not only not in pain anymore, but she was also now not using her walker. And then I got to meet her at a social event, and she had described her life um, that she really had been a caregiver, taking care of her mom um, from the time that she was 14. And then when she got married, um, her husband, taking care of him. And so she had spent the majority of her adult life uh, up until now into her 70s where she had been a caregiver. And since her husband died two years ago, she really hadn't gotten out and socialized. And that by going to the gym, it didn't only help her physical health and her physical well-being, but she now had friends from the gym coming to her house, and she was going to their house. And she said, Robin, I haven't had friends like this since I was 14. Um, so that kind of takes me ne to our next slide and kind of taking a look, what do our patients look like and who are the, the people that we're looking for? Well, we're focusing, our first outreach just included people that lived alone, but then we knew that um, people that live with others, um, they live with family, but they spent the majority of their day in isolation, that we begin to include that. And then the other uh, group is um, caregivers with little support. And that's kind of where this member had been before she got out and began exercising. And she had been such a caregiver. And so um, these are also people with very poor social support systems. Um, they also are referred to our program because they, they actually self-report that they're lonely. Uh, one of the things that we did um, when we started our program, we did a lot of education with our clinicians that we now include the loneliness scale um, within our medical records so that anyone would be able to uh, refer any clinician every time you touch bases with someone that, um, you know, if they come in and they're coming in for their diabetes, we're not just assessing that. We're also assessing to see what their support systems are like and if they are um, reporting self-loneliness. Um, then we also have a big focus on new widows uh, who have little support. And our average age of the group that we've had um, is 74 and about 40% male and about 60% female. 
Um, and the next slide is actually a picture of, of Bob and Norma. That's actually my mom and dad, um, where loneliness kind of impacts my family. But taking a look at why it's so important for us to, to look at the caregivers, that 40 to 70 percent of caregivers experience a clinical depre depression that's actually coming from that isolation and impact um, of being that caregiver, that we know how important it has been to, to reach out to those. And then um, if you go to our next slide, our, our first year insights, um, we've, it's been a little over a year, and so these were some of our earlier numbers. Um, that 700 referrals are all those community-based resources that we're referring people to or any programs to do that. And so one of the things that we're, we're looking at is taking a look at what are their barriers and, and how that is impacting. And we have seen a 11% reduction in acute cost. Um, we've also seen um, a decline um, in going to emergency rooms, about 5%. But the statistic I love, because I see the overall effect, is we've had an increase of 53% of um, people in our program that were not exercising before that are now exercising. Um, we've had over 15,000 calls to, to connect to all these people, but we've also seen um, a significant reduction in depression. Currently, we have over 900 in our program. And if you go to the next slide, It'll take a look where I was talking about the barriers. The top half of this slide is kind of looking at their barriers to socialization. Um, and, and one of the things that um, in the first year I was working with a system where they could only um, pick one. And so um, this next year I, I will be excited to see we have a new data system where we can collect if it's more than just one reason why they're not isolating. Um, and if they um, identified more than one, my staff kind of picked the one that was the biggest. And as you can see, 51%, um, the largest, was medical issues. Um, and then we, we had such a, a large group of pain that we, we pulled that one out separately. Um, and then there's a lot of grief and loss. I think it may be higher um, when we start tracking and seeing that they could, I, we could track and follow more than one barrier. But the other thing that I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, what were the barriers in developing our population, our uh, program? And the first one is, um, this is kind of an invisible population. Um, it, they're hard to find. Um, so we did initial outreach of about 1,100 of our members when they come in and they do a healthy start that they had marked on their, their health risk assessment that they lived alone and they had uh, poor to no social support. So that was our initial outreach. Then we went into where we actually sent out a letter to all our members and describing the program. And we had a very large number of um, members to self-referral uh, into the program and continue. We had one person, it was almost six months after the letter went out that they had been holding on to the letter and they were just embarrassed and, um, and felt embarrassed to say that they were lonely and they needed someone to talk to. And another thing is just the lack of education, uh, not only among um, the community, but in healthcare in general. Um, and so educating our clinicians, um, educating people in our member services if someone calls in that they may be lonely. And then we also worked in having community forums uh, because of the lack of education in the community. And I'm, I'm really excited that we're having a, a webinar like today that we can really kind of increase that. Um, so those have been some of the, the challenges and things that we come to. One of the things is we're also, the next slide is a picture of how we're now changing in our care centers. We're redesigning to have a social space actually within our, our care setting. And so you're seeing here guitar lessons. And Mike is the one there in the center. He used to come into the care center on Mondays and just bring his guitar. And we now have a social connector in the care center. So when people are coming in for their health appointments, that we kind of engage them in these social activities. You can kind of see the, the table there with the puzzles, they have games. So we have structured social groups where we're bringing people in, things like um, Techie Tuesday, where, um, believe it or not, some of the things they want to come in is learn how to text a picture on their phone back to their grandkids. And so in trying to help them find ways that through technology that they, they can get more connected. Um, and then Mike's wife is there. She also started a crocheting, a crocheting class. 
that they're actually making beanies for people getting chemo and, and lap blankets for people in hospice. So really helping them connect and find that kind of meaning and purpose. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, it's kind of wrapping up is, you know, what can we all do today that, that we want to have a program or things like this? Well, one is just really talking about the issue with your friends and family, your loved ones, patients, providers, really getting the word out there why it's so important for us to really connect. And then the other thing is, is really helping um, people connect to their purpose and meaning in life. Um, you know, one of the gentlemen that I uh, talked to probably in the first 100 phone calls that I made and kind of coming up with, um, you know, how we're going to create this program, it was really clear that he had lost his meaning and purpose in life. And that story previously, the, the previous slide of Mike, he said it's given him purpose and meaning now that he's teaching other people how to play guitar. It's not just him coming in, but he feels like he's making a difference in someone's life. And that, that's made him healthier and want to take better care of himself. And then the last thing is just reaching out to, to people in the community. Maybe if it's just you're in a restaurant and you see someone eating alone, you might go over and say, hey, would you like to join me? Um, but that's really kind of I call the, the secret sauce of our program is that, 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 um, that power and that human connection that has really um, had that impact on our members' lives in so many ways. Um, so that's kind of wrapping it up. I'm, I'm hoping all of us after today can think about just when you see someone alone out there in the community that, that we all can make a difference. And, and it's something I think a lot of times in healthcare, we can talk ourselves out of doing something that thinks that it sounds too complicated. We can't do that. Um, but it is something that we can address um, in healthcare. And it, it's, it's time that we do. And um, I know a lot, the UK just had a big conference um, that Julianne was able to attend that, that, that we now need to advocate for those same types of programs and things that we can do and make a difference here in the U.S. Catherine, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robin, for sharing your innovative approach. And uh, quite a few questions came in for you, so we'll, we're going to start our Q&A section um, and ask uh, our speakers to come off of mute uh, to answer a few questions. You can continue to submit them in the Q&A box on your screen, and we will try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll start, um, I think this one is for Robin, but others can comment as well, since we've, we have been talking a lot about some of the, the social, um, social aspects and social determinants. But this question is about how, you know, pain and depression are medical issues that, that can cause isolation and, you know, really addressing these medical, medical needs. Could you speak to that a little bit? And maybe, Robin, it's talking about, you know, how you're connecting seniors, you know, through the Care More Healthcare Delivery Model in yeah. addition to your togetherness program. Yes, and, and I think that's why it's, it's so needed uh, with health providers to really educate them. If, if they don't know how to assess the loneliness, they don't know how to address it. And so what we're doing when we see, when we're talking to someone and those are their barriers or the things they're facing, that we can connect them back to their providers and connect them to those resources to help them with their pain. Um, we do a lot of referring to pain management. Um, but it's also interesting that a lot of times when they are isolated and lonely, their, their day is pretty much sitting on the couch uh, inactive, that that's also um, increasing um, their pain and, and some of those medical issues, that getting them reengaged in something also helps them care a little bit more about themselves, um, like the lady who didn't want to go exercise. Um, but having that relationship is also important to connecting them, to, to feel that someone kind of cares about them, helps them to kind of care a little bit more about their own health. Here's a, a follow-up question for Julianne uh, related to loneliness and depression. Uh, the question says, I understand the definition differences and how they might be addressed differently, but how would you answer if someone asks, if they are different constructs or if loneliness is just a type of depression? Um, oh, so the, the distinction between depression and, and loneliness, uh, certainly uh, 
Depression can be associated with social withdrawal that can lead to loneliness and social isolation. Uh, And conversely, uh, loneliness and social isolation uh, have been linked to uh, increased rates of depression. One thing to keep in mind is that in terms of their health risks, and uh, particularly in the research that I've done around premature mortality, is that uh, these studies uh, most statistically controlled for depression so that it was able to establish the independent effect of of loneliness and isolation. Uh, So their effect on health risks and, and specifically premature mortality was independent of any risk associated with depression. So uh, they they can be related, not always, so not everyone who's lonely or socially isolated is depressed, but they can be related, uh, but they are indeed uh, uh, separate and independent as well. Great, thank you. Um, a question for John. You know, we heard a little bit about, you know, the care more and what they're doing for Medicare population, you know, are you aware or kind of what are the opportunities for Medicaid or Medicare to support efforts to address loneliness or, or what, what would sort of the policy options be? Uh, I'm not up to date on what Medicare is doing at the moment. At the time I was there, there was a lot of focus on how, how we could move resources into community supports. For example, the Affordable Care Act had in it a major investment, billion dollar investment in uh, easing transitions from institutions to communities, and that required finding uh, resources in communities such as CareMore's connecting people to to help them um, have have forms of support other than just the medical care system. Those were highly successful projects. Uh, Joanne Lynn has done a lot of uh, evaluation uh, of such efforts, and uh, and they they really do pay off. Um, the other uh, uh, the, the other idea, is, of course, is to, to do more of what WHO calls health in all policies. Sometimes investments of what would be otherwise be healthcare dollars in, in uh, non-healthcare supports, visiting would be one, uh, is important. And I don't know what CMS is doing right now to, to capitalize on those relationships. I sure hope that they're progressing as fast as they can. Great. Thank you. Um, this question is, you know, social media has a strong influence um, that could support social connection, but also can increase the risk for depression, disconnect, lack of in-person interaction. Um, what are all of your recommendations or just comments on how to support healthy social media engagement to prevent these issues being discussed today? This is Robin. Um, I spoke at the uh, Stanford Medicine X conference, which has a lot of patient population there that spoke, and they really have used, um, with chronic diseases, social media, different groups, you know, um, to to really bring the community together. Um, uh, But it also, again, can distract and take things away where people look and see what's doing that. So I think that it can be used in right ways. And then um, we know that it can also get people to disconnect um, by not having an in-person connection. So I think it um, it has to be used wisely. Um, but I, I, I do think that it has the capability to be something that can be used as a powerful tool to connect people. And, and seeing that coming strictly from the chronic disease um, patient population and some of the communities I've worked with. Uh, this is Don. I'll, I'll agree with, with what Robin said. Uh, I've seen a lot of really interesting uh, experiments on using social media uh, to get people connections they otherwise wouldn't have, and I think I think the results look pretty favorable to me. Professor David Gustafson at the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Madison, has for years been working on this, especially with frail elders and people you think might not be friendly users of social media, but they actually do very very well. I'm aware of uh, the quite amazing system called Care Message, which is uh, essentially a coaching and support system for isolated, disadvantaged pe- uh, pe- people, isolated people in disadvantaged populations who are helping them 
address their, their needs, especially chronic illness needs, and the results look extremely promising. So I think this is a pretty exciting area of innovation. Um, this is Julianne. I'll, I'll weigh in as well, I guess. <laughs> um, so as, as we all uh, know, uh, technology has uh, changed in many ways the way in which we interact socially. And uh, while there are a variety of uh, technologies, um, I think we tend to focus primarily on smartphones and Facebook, um, which is, you know, of course, technology is much broader than that. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the research that I summarized around the, the risk for premature mortality because these followed people over years and in most cases decades, uh, many of these studies really uh, began prior to the widespread use of uh, m many you know, social technologies and in particular social media uh, and uh, before the widespread uh, adoption of smartphones, which people are using around 2012 as, as the, the time point in which more than 50% of Americans uh, had smartphones. And so we need to recognize that this is a relatively recent um, uh, development, and so we really don't know the long-term effects uh, in terms of, of socializing or how this affects um, the, the social aspects uh, on health. And uh, so one of the things that we can recognize is that this data is based on existing uh, close relationships and social networks. And so the extent to which technology can foster those, facilitate interaction, uh, that, that presumably or uh, we would hypothesize that that would be associated with more positive outcomes and the extent to which it displaces uh, and takes time away from relationships, that that might be associated with more negative kinds of outcomes. And so we do need to take into account that how these are used um, may have very different outcomes as well. Great, thank you. This question is for Robin. Um, could you talk about what screening tool you use for social determinants of health as well as the loneliness scale that you mentioned? Uh, yes. So we use the, um, the UCLA loneliness um, three questionnaire um, scale. And we have, like I said, we have that in our medical records. We also have, um, you know, my background is I'm a social worker. So we really have a, a psychosocial type of assessment where we kind of are assessing every category um, when, when we're talking to them. So we, we, you know, we might even talk to them about home safety or whatever. So we're just going through and basically checking all the different areas uh, and looking for those needs. But mainly when we're talking to them about why they don't leave and why they don't go out, we start talking about what are their barriers, why they don't leave. And so it's really sometimes in that friendly conversation that we're talking where they, they talk about, you know, well, since my husband died, I, I really don't get out anymore. I did everything with him. So we, we're, we're using that. Um, but um, really using those social work tools of assessing all their, their different community needs. Great. Thank you. Um, how, a question for any of the speakers, maybe, uh, Julianne, how does racial inequity play a role in this research on loneliness? Is the, the black-white gap that's seen over different social determinants of health seen in relation to loneliness as well? Um, that's a great question. And uh, when we look to the meta-analytic data, um, Unfortunately, a lot of the research did not provide uh, differences or different or separate effect sizes based on uh, race or ethnicity, and so there wasn't a way to specifically uh, test for that. Uh, 
certainly there are different kinds of challenges that come in terms of addressing the issue, as well as there is data, um, for instance, from the recent BBC survey that shows that uh, uh, discrimination, uh, regardless of the source, whether it's race or age or sexual orientation or, or any other kind of distinction, that uh, if there's um, perceived discrimination, that that puts people at increased risk uh, for loneliness. And so uh, that is something certainly to take into account as we uh, try to address this important issue. Uh, this is Don. I'm, I'm sure it would be incorrect to assume that just because someone is uh, is in a disadvantaged community, they don't have social networks. I'm sure that's often not the case. However, if you think about it for a minute and imagine what it takes not to be isolated, access to transportation, uh, to to be able to use community services and so on, I would I would be willing to bet strongly that uh, poverty and isolation are 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 they're, they're sin they go together because the resources one needs to connect. Uh, may well be uh, may well require one to have some some money available. Great, thank you. Um, two questions for Robin: um, What level are the clinicians that are doing the calls through the Togetherness program? And also, how do you identify the appropriate community-based organization that you're referring seniors to? Okay, great. Um, my staff are not clinicians. They are um, trained to have incredible, great, friendly phone calls, but they would be more like your health representatives or things like that. Um, I do have uh, social work interns that work with me that make home visits for our more high-risk and, and programs like that. And then one of the other things I didn't really get to share in, um, in our program, one of the things that we've done is uh, we've enlisted um, – all employees across the way, of, because the majority of these phone calls are just friendly calls um, to manage their, their loneliness. Um, and so sometimes they want to talk about politics, they want to talk about uh, sports and things like that. So anyone at, that's an Anthem associate can sign up to be a phone pal, and they have a small training um, that they do. And so we have associates in accounting or other areas are having those friendly phone calls. However, if they have a, a need that comes up, like they're talking to um, the, the member and they say, well, I'm out of food, then they connect back to my staff that, that do that. Um, and kind of how we determine that is really based from the community they were they're at and, and what their needs are. Um, so, you know, if they're needing food, so what their base is is those, those types of community agencies that we use. And we really work um, to having a, a, a good relationship with those communities. We can't do it alone in healthcare without all those community-based organizations. They really are a, a big partner in what we're doing. Great. Thank you. Um, this, we talked a little bit about the you know, depression and, and sort of mental health um, connections, but how about um, – are there any connections in terms of the risk and the barriers in terms of getting patients to acknowledge their own isolation? Um, they feel they're isolated but don't feel lonely. How do you reach them if they don't want to personally acknowledge isolation? And also, how do you do that without kind of preventing um, them from, you know, just feeling like they want to push away from being offered other services? Well, this is Robin. I can say in our program, we do have um, uh, people that, um, in our initial uh, list where we're calling and reaching out to people that we weren't really sure they were lonely or, or isolated or not. All we know is they, they marked two things on their assessment. And they did notice a larger amount of those um, that somehow had either not been self-identified as being lonely or whatever. They were a little um, more resistant. Um, it took a little bit more uh, work to kind of engage with them, but we do have some, you know, I, I would probably say maybe um, a 3 to 5% that we connect and we kind of assess that they are, but they are just like, 
they really we have some that that choose to be in our program but they don't want our interventions they don't want to go out in the community they don't want to go anywhere and if if nothing other than the fact that when we're, we're calling and talking to them um that hopefully through that relationship at time goes on they might choose some of those things but there are some that kind of choose my that picture of my father and mother when i was showing him my dad has pretty much refused almost any kind of intervention that we've tried to help get him to be more social now that my mom's had to go into a care home um so you're going to have some of those that um you, you can tr- you know you can offer those uh, resources and things but there's some that will re- decline it Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any lessons learned for the U.S. from the recent work that's occurring in the U.K., or, you know, what are we learning from other cultures about social cohesion, communal support systems that we could apply and benefit from here in the U.S.? Um, this is Julianne. Uh, since I just returned from the UK, uh, I, I can speak a little bit to to this issue. And uh, as as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, they have appointed a minister uh, for loneliness, and they, uh, which is a government appointee uh, who. Uh, has been tasked with addressing this issue. They just released their national strategy uh, today. Um, Robin and I were talking about it earlier. Um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, uh, but they uh, are being very strategic about this. Uh, they also recognize that the rest of the world is watching. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, uh, she uh, expressed a little um, reticence around recognizing that that there's a lot of pressure on them to to not um, mess it up. Um, but uh, one of the things that I was asked over and over again, I had multiple meetings with various uh, organizations and uh, both inside of government and and community. And uh, they asked, what is the U.S. doing? What are you doing about this? And when, when, can you, when are you going to get started on this? <laughs> um, and, you know, so I had to try and uh, explain some of the, the steps that are being done thus far, but also recognizing that there is... Uh, some differences, particularly one of the largest differences is between our healthcare systems. Uh, and so it's unclear to what extent uh, that sort of barrier might exist. Uh, one particularly interesting uh, point that they mentioned was that this was something, this issue was something that they uh, had been considering and uh but that with the uh with Joe Cox the MP that uh was very passionate about this issue being murdered uh was a real impetus to drawing national attention to this issue and to uh those who worked with her and honored her and communities that um, really respected her, rallying around uh, continuing uh, those efforts. And that is something that cannot be replicated uh, in terms of getting the national attention around the issue to motivate people to recognize the evidence and the data around this and to really care about the issue enough to really move that evidence into larger practice. Uh, And uh, I'm sure that Robin and Dawn can talk a little bit more about other efforts, uh, but uh, we do need to recognize a few potential barriers that we do face here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. 
I would just add uh, to that, uh, I, I think the World Health Organization's work on health in all policies is very relevant to this conversation. And if uh, participants in the webinar here who have not t gotten on the WHO website, just put in health in all policies uh, or social determinants of health, and you're going to see a lot of very, very helpful documentation about uh, frameworks and ideas. There's, there's good thought leadership there. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Unfortunately, that will have to be our last question, but I do want to thank our excellent panel of speakers for being with us today. These were really enriching presentations. Um, if the audience missed any of them, we will make a recording available on our website as well as copies of the slides, and we've, um, we'll post some additional resources, and we can post the, the WHO link as well. Um, we would like to ask the audience to take a minute to share feedback from this event uh, by completing a brief survey, which can be found on the bottom of your screen. And thank you all again so much for joining us today.